Okay, geometry students, this is a unit one crash review as we get ready for our semester exam. As you're going to see in these first couple units, we had tons and tons of vocabulary. And you may even recall me saying back at the beginning of the year, you better learn your vocabulary. If you don't, you're going to struggle throughout this entire year. Well, as you look back at some of these terms and concepts now, I think you'll probably be able to see the absolute truth of what I was trying to get you to understand back seven and eight months ago. Okay, so we started off with the basic discussion of points, lines, planes, and their attributes. Okay, uh, so first off, uh, Euclidean geometry, that has been the course that we've been studying, uh, the geometry according to the Greek mathematician Euclid. Uh, Euclid. Euclidean geometry is the study of flat space. Uh, he combined the works of several people, of course they didn't have the internet and YouTube and stuff like that back in the day, so as everybody was doing different work on exploring and discovering geometry for the very first time, Euclid was the one that kind of gathered all the info information together and tied it all together with his own concepts and he wrote several chapter books that were titled the elements okay now euclid's idea was based upon constructed definitions and then what we refer to as undefined terms now uh, we saw some other stuff of course uh, you have the dif uh, difference between euclidean's idea of distance which is, of course the old definition that you know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line but as we've kind of come to understand more in uh, more modern geometry how geometry applies to the real world sometimes you are unable to actually connect two points with a straight line perhaps you have to uh, divert around certain things which is what we call taxi cab geometry geometry, or another way to think of that is geometry on graph paper. If you have to stay on the lines in order to get from one location to another, then most likely that is a concept in taxicab geometry. And taxicab geometry is just one of the non-Euclidean forms of geometry. Now, Euclid basically boiled everything down in geometry to three basic structures, the point, the line, and the plane. And these guys were basically the most basic structures that existed in the geometric world that existed in zero-dimensional space. That's your point. Uh, First-dimensional space is your line. And second-dimensional space is your plane. And the reason you're in a point is in zero-dimensional space is because it has no length, no width, no depth. A line is first dimensional space because it does have length, but no width and no depth. And a plane is in second dimensional space because it has length and width, but no depth. And of course, we started to see the very first uh, occurrence of how we name stuff. Of course, in all of geometry, when we name something, we name it according to what kind of a structure it is. And then we have to adjust uh, what the name is according to uh, the particular type of structure. But we saw the very first instance of point P. Point, you have to identify what kind of a structure it is. And then points come with a single capital letter in order to name them. There are lines. Of course, we said uh, lines would be named according to what they are, a line. And you needed to name two points off of the line. You could name any two points that you wanted. Typically, it's most proper to pick the uh, points that are the furthest out uh, on that line within the diagram. So you wouldn't necessarily pick two points that are in the middle and call it uh, that line. Uh, but you'd pick the two points on the very extreme edges of the line. Uh, we saw our first instance of little symbols that we saw throughout the year. A line can be symbolized by writing your points back to back, like you can see there in the lower right, with a little line over the top of them. And since lines go on infinitely in both directions, you put little arrows on both ends. We came across a new term that is applied from time to time, and the term is collinear. Collinear means of the same line. Any two things that are in the same line are collinear. Okay, a line that only carried on in one direction was what we called a ray, and when we came time to name a ray, you must remember that the end point of the ray must be named first. Okay, so the end point gets named first, and then any point that is on the extended end of the ray can be listed second. But again, it's most proper to pick the furthest point away from the uh, end point as your second point to list. Uh, we came across a term that hadn't applied too often, okay, but it is out there, and that is if you have two rays that begin at a common end point and head exactly away from each other, those are what we call opposite rays. 
line segment is, of course, a line that does not continue infinitely in either direction. It has two endpoints. When you name a line segment, you must list the two endpoints. And we, again, had a little symbol over the top of this one for a uh, segment. And, of course, it's a little line that does not have any endpoints. I missed that on the previous slide with the ray. The ray does have a little symbol. Okay, The endpoint goes above the letter that's the endpoint, and the arrow goes the other direction. And since you always list the endpoint first, that means that your ray or your arrow on your ray symbol is always going to the right. Here's one that some of us are actually still struggling with after all these months, and that is what happens if you have two points listed back to back with no symbol over the top of them. When this happens, the question or the problem is referring to a distance, a length between the two points that are listed. Plane is our most basic object in second dimensional space. And typically, there's two ways to name a plane. It is possible that the uh, person who constructed the diagram might actually give you a reference name within the plane. And you can see it sitting in the lower left-hand corner of this plane. It doesn't have to be in the lower left, but they will typically position it towards one of the interior corners of the planes or possibly label it exterior uh, to the uh, figure itself by actually writing the words plain and then whatever name they want to call it. If they do not give you a name to call it, it takes three non-collinear points in order to name a plain. And please note, some of you have had a problem with this this year. Okay, if we say it takes three points to name a plane, that doesn't mean you list every point that is in the plane, and there's nine of them, so you just list off all nine points. If we say it takes three points to name a plane, then it takes three points, so list those three points, and that is it. As long as the points are not in a straight line, you can use those three points in order to name a plane. There is no symbol in geometry that goes along with uh, identifying a plane, so when it comes time to write it out, you actually have to write the word plane. Another definition there, if two or more things are going to exist in the same plane, then they are called coplanar. Okay, coplanar means of the same plane. All right, so that was the first lesson, a lot of vocabulary already. Okay, now looking at lines existing uh, together in a diagram. If lines exist in the same plane and they do not intersect, then they are referred to as parallel lines. Okay, so we had to dump an old junior high definition where we just said parallel lines do not touch. Well, there's a lot of things in geometry that do not touch. That does not make them parallel. If they do not touch and they are in the same plane, then they are parallel. We saw a lot of different uh, ways to represent parallel. We've seen the little triangle in the body of the lines uh, throughout the entire year. Uh, they don't have to be triangles. They could be little arrows within the body of the line, or it's possible that they might notate parallel lines, kind of like down at the bottom, where uh, it's basically just given to you in written or symbolic form that two things are going to be parallel. Okay, so we talked about uh, the fact that in geometry as well, it is impossible, okay, the human eye is not capable of detecting uh, whether two short lines are going to be parallel or not, okay, and I gave you that example up top, okay, and uh, a lot of people said, yep, they're parallel, they sure look like they're parallel, they're not going to touch, and then I took the same two lines and I extended them outward uh, further down at the bottom of the screen, and you can see absolutely that they are not parallel, Okay. So your eyes are not a good, uh, not a good measuring stick to decide if two things are going to be parallel or not. That means we're going to have to refer, uh, rely on the mathematics of it. Okay. Now, if you have two lines that are not uh, in, not intersecting and not in the same plane, we have what we call skew lines. Okay. This term hasn't shown up very often, but it is a very specific term, and it does have its application. So I'd make sure I know this one. Okay. If they're in the same plane and don't touch, that's parallel. If they're not in the same plane and don't touch, that's skew. All right, uh, we talked about the intersections. Okay, if any types of lines intersect, any two types of lines intersect, the intersection is always a single point. They're going to touch each other once, and then that's it. They are not going to turn back around and come back and hit each other again. Same idea when a line of any kind intersects a plane. When it passes through, it's going to form a single point there. The line's not coming back. Okay, it's already gone through. It's going to intersect. It's going to make a single point, and that is that. If two planes happen to intersect each other, 
okay, then there is kind of a continuous intersection as the planes continue on forever and ever. They continue to intersect forever and ever. That is going to give us a line. Okay, next day we looked at uh, more at line segments. We came across our first occurrence of the word congruent, and we very simply defined the word congruent as meaning equal measurement. There are a lot of things that we've run into in geometry that have had equal measurements and had a lot of different requirements in order to get those equal measurements. So in junior high, you came to believe that congruent meant same size, same shape. Well, if you're talking about congruent polygons, then right you are. But there's a lot of other kinds of congruent than just congruent polygons. Whenever we decided we needed to uh, have information about two line segments being congruent to each other, being the same length as each other, we quickly learned that tick marks would be used. And those are the little hash marks that show up somewhere within the body of the line. And wherever you have matching numbers of tick marks in a diagram, then you have equal measurements in that diagram. Okay, first definition for angle, most people already knew, okay, but technically in geometry, an angle is two rays originating from a common end point. That common end point is referred to as the vertex, and later we learned that the two rays themselves are called the legs of the angle. Okay, now there's a few different ways to label angles. We started off by saying, you know what, they might actually give us a little reference number inside of the interior of the angle. Okay. And we could refer to it by angle, whatever number they gave us. Now keep in mind that that does not mean if you have a 90 degree angle that that is called angle 90. There's a difference between a degree measurement and a naming uh, announcement that's in there. Okay, so uh, be sure to pay attention for that. And of course you can tell the difference because a name is not going to have a degree marker. A measurement is going to have a degree marker. We had a little symbol for angle. It looks like a little less than sign with a little curved arc passing through it. And that is kind of the symbolic abbreviation for angle. More than likely, what we learned uh, pretty quickly was that we needed the three-point naming system in order to correctly identify angles. Because as it became obvious, there were a lot of cases where you could say something like, angle J, but perhaps there might be several different angles connected to vertex J. So saying angle J didn't actually mean anything. But by naming our angles by the three-point naming system, it became very clear to us exactly which angle was talking about. Uh, so anyway, in the three-point naming system, wherever your vertex is, whatever your vertex is, whatever its name is, must be listed second in the three-point system. So you're going to pick a point that is on one of the legs of the angle, then secondly, the vertex gets named, and then the last of the three uh, vertex vertices that is listed is down the other leg. So you're going to pick a vertex on a leg, or then the vertex of the angle, and then a point out on the other leg. By naming it with the three-point system, there is absolutely no chance that we ever miss identifying an angle correctly. We also saw that there was a, a mark that could show up in a diagram for angle congruence, and you can see it. It's a little arc-looking guy that appears inside of the angle down near the vertex. And the same as tick marks, anytime you see in a diagram the same number of angle congruency marks uh, in that diagram, you will have congruent angles anywhere that has the same number of those marks. All right, uh, we came across several uh, very similar definitions. Okay, midpoint is obviously something that is in the middle. Bisected is basically something that has been cut exactly in half. So in order to be bisected, in the case of a line segment, you must have a midpoint. If you have a midpoint, we can say that that particular point is equidistant from the two end points. Equidistant, meaning equal distances. Okay, types of angles. This was a good bit of review from back in junior high days for most of you. Okay, we saw, uh, had seen most of these before. Possibly the only, uh, the only one that might have been remotely new is the idea of a straight angle. Acute angles measure anywhere in between 0 degrees and 90 degrees, but they do not measure 0 or 90 degrees. If an angle does measure 90 degrees, that's what we call a right angle, and an obtuse angle measures between zero, uh, 90 degrees and 180 degrees, but not 90 and not 180. And if an angle 
measures exactly 180, then that is what we call a straight angle. If angles get larger than 180 degrees, then what we do is we kind of turn around to the other side of the angle and we measure the shorter side of that angle rather than the larger side of that angle. Okay, here's a term that some of us have continued to struggle with. That is the term adjacent. When a, an angles are announced as adjacent angles, we are simply say, saying that those angles share a leg with each other. Perpendicular, you should know well by now, whenever you have uh, two lines, rays or line segments intersect and form a right angle, that is what we call perpendicular. We have a little symbol for perpendicular. It is the upside down capital T you see at the bottom. Linear pair, I said we would struggle with it, and yes, we have. Linear pair are adjacent angles, okay, they share a leg, and the other legs of those two angles form a straight angle. It's an important definition. When they write tests, they love to pull out words like linear pair because they know y'all aren't going to bother to learn it. Uh, vertical angles, some of us still struggling with this one. There is a difference between the word vertical in the English language than there is vertical in the geometric language. Okay, vertical in geometry does not have anything to do with being up and down. You need to reprogram your brain with that. Vertical means across from each other at an intersection. And the basic rule is that vertical angles, wherever they are, they will always be congruent with each other in that diagram. Complementary angles, most of you knew this one. There's two angles that add to 90 degrees, and supplementary are two angles that add to 180 degrees. Some of you are still struggling with getting these confused with each other. Remember what I told you back in the day. If you just think alphabetically, C for complementary comes before S for supplementary in the alphabet, C before S. And numerically, 90 degrees comes before 180 degrees as you're counting upward. So C before S, 90 before 180. The C and the 90 go together, the S and the 180 go together. Okay, we worked through some examples there. Then we got into some discussions of reasoning, and this was a little bit tough for some of us, so you may need to look back over this. Okay, we had two different types of reasoning. We had first inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is making predictions based upon observable patterns. Most of our rules and theorems that are written in geometry are based upon inductive reasoning. They noticed that every single time you had a right triangle, the leg squared plus the other leg squared always equaled the hypotenuse squared. It happened every single time. They noticed the pattern, so finally they wrote a theorem about it. Okay, these predictions or theorems that are written are called conjectures. Conjectures are supposed to be true. Okay, if you can find any way or any reason why your conjecture would be false, then you have discovered a counterexample, and that should mean that the conjecture should be discarded. If you can find a way for a rule to be false, then obviously it is not a rule. Okay, so we talked a bit about inductive. We saw for the very first time conditional format, and this has raised its head throughout the year. Conditional format is written generally if P, then Q. And P is the information where the hypothesis goes, and Q is the information where the conclusion goes. Now, the hypothesis is not the word if, it is the information that is associated with the observation. Okay, when you look into the problem or look into a situation and you can notice that, hey, this thing is happening, then that is going to be your hypothesis. Okay, the conclusion is associated with the word then. It's not the word then. Then it's the information that's associated with it, okay? And the conclusion is, okay, now that I have noticed this observation, okay, here is what I have to say about it. That is your conclusion.
The other type of reasoning that we talked about was referred to as deductive reasoning. Now, deductive reasoning doesn't necessarily hold a whole lot of mathematical weight because it does require a couple of leaps of faith. You, you have to have additional external information for deductive reasoning to really work. And deductive reasoning is facts based upon other facts. Okay, so it's, it's kind of like if you're familiar with the old six degrees of separation where you connect one fact to another fact and that fact to another fact and that fact to yet another one and so on. And in the end, you end up with two completely unrelated pieces of information being said to be factual based upon each other. Well, it, it's kind of a reach in math. Typically, we don't jump over, you know, unknown or information that way. But it is a type of reasoning we were required to know it, so that's what it was. Deductive reasoning, facts based upon other facts. The next thing we did has, has uh, as well continued to raise its head uh, throughout the year, and that was taking the conditional format, if P then Q, and adjusting it in different ways. And one of the ways uh, that we uh, have used this uh, considerably has been the converse of the conditional statement. Now, what a converse did, it took the hypothesis and the conclusion, and it reversed them. So instead of saying, if P then Q, it caused a reversal of the hypothesis and conclusion, so it turned into, if Q, then P. And what we have seen this year is that the strongest of our mathematical theorems, like the Pythagorean theorem and the parallel lines theorems, uh, they have uh, had converses that have also been true. Okay, inverse left the P and the Q alone, left the hypothesis and the conclusion where they were, but it reversed the meaning or negated the meaning of each of them. Okay, so we saw if not P, then not Q. And again, the strongest of our theorems have had those also true. Contrapositive, basically if you can remember converse and inverse, then contrapositive does both of them at the same time. It is like saying the inverse of the converse. So it's going to take your hypothesis and conclusion, it's going to reverse them in the conditional format, and it's going to reverse their meanings. Okay, It's going to negate them. So instead of if P, then Q, we end up with if not P, then not Q. Okay, I think this was all just an example. And that was that. Anyway, that brought us to the Unit 1 test. Okay, so we got kind of hit the ground running. There was a lot of information in Unit 1 right off the bat. So if you have definitions that are in there, you probably definitely want to get those memorized. If you haven't done so yet, uh, a lot of the information and definitions that we have done since then have stood on the shoulders of these basic definitions all the way back to Unit 1.